Joining us now, legal analyst, U.S. Attorney to the District of Columbia, Joe DeGeneva. Joe, good morning. Good morning. Joe, I want to start off with something that you have brought up to us about an excerpt in George Papadopoulos's book where he talks about uh, having met Shai Arbel, who's the co-founder of Israel's cyber intelligence company, Terra Gents, and uh, alleging that there that this guy, Shai Arbel was part of a scheme to plant marked hundred dollar bills on him that would incriminate him when FBI agents searched his luggage when he got back to the U.S. and I re- and I remember him talking about that, saying how they were just ripping through all of his stuff as if they were looking for something. So this makes sense. This is what it would be. Why would that happen? Uh, because the FBI was trying to create a crime and then force him to testify against the president by creating this crime of bringing illegally back into the United States $10,000 or more in cash. Uh, Papadopoulos, uh, to his girlfriend, his then girlfriend's credit, now his wife, she said, don't you dare bring that back to the United States. Uh, You have no idea what this is all about. So she said, leave it with your lawyer in Greece, which he did. And he came back to the United States and was greeted immediately by FBI agents who were frantically going through all of his luggage and briefcases trying to find the $10,000, which, of course, he didn't have with him. So Papadopoulos was set up from the very beginning uh, to put him in a position where Mueller could lean on him and create uh, uh, and create pressure uh, to make him make up information about the president of the United States. It's pretty disgusting, the entire thing about him. And, of course, Michael Flynn was exactly the same thing, only there was no money involved. Joe, you know, you've been on this issue for a while, and I'm curious, what is your understanding of how the Trump-Russia investigation began? Because Papadopoulos has often cited the beginnings of this, Alexander Downer, Crossfire Hurricane, July of 2016, but it feels yeah. like the seeds of this were much earlier. What, when did this all start? Well, I've been looking at this along with Victoria Tunsing, uh, my law partner and wife, since July 6th, 2016, when... James Comey cleared Hillary Clinton in his famous news conference where he basically destroyed her campaign, right. lied to the American people, usurped the functions of the attorney general, and broke every rule in the book for investigators. Uh, this started in 2015. Let me underscore this. The attempt to take down the president began in 2015 when he was an announced candidate. There is evidence that people in the CIA and others began to develop evidence against Trump with the assistance of people in the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2015. Uh, This information is going to come out eventually as a result of the referrals that Devin Nunes has made over the last few days for at least eight, probably more than that, criminal referrals against people. So, again, uh, the record's going to become abundantly clear. And as Bill Barr impanels grand juries, which he will, to investigate the illegality inside the Department of Justice at the highest levels and the FBI, the timing of all of this is going to become uh, pretty depressing for the American people. They're going to find out that uh, Barack Obama's people, Sally Yates, Loretta Lynch, John Carlin, the head of the National Security Division, all the people at the senior levels of the FBI were in fact colluding with each other uh, to boost Hillary Clinton into the presidency and stop Donald Trump from uh, A, getting the nomination, and then B, being elected, and then C, trying to get him removed from office. Mark Meadows yesterday said that he fully believes that we're going to see some criminal referrals coming from the IG's report, which we expect to come out in the next four to six weeks. Do you agree with that? Uh, Yes, I do. Um, Mr. Meadows and Mr. Nunes have, in fact, met with Mr. Horowitz. As you know, uh, inspectors general are creatures of Congress. Their duty is to respond to Congress and to provide reports to Congress as well as their executive uh, benefactors. The uh, IG has told them he's going to make additional criminal referrals. That, of course, will involve, involve the FISA process. It will probably also involve partially some of the leaking and unmasking or unmasking and then the leaking that went on involving senior FBI officials. People have to remember, I always tell people on WMAL, remember that in April of 2017, the chief judge of the FISA court issued a ruling which was ultimately declassified by the director of national intelligence, which categoried five years of illegal 
spying, you should pardon the expression, spying <laughs> uh, on Americans by contractors for the FBI. All of that illegal activity was conducted by senior officials of the FBI with the knowledge of senior Department of Justice officials. All of that activity is going to lead to criminal charges against all of the people involved in it because they violated the Espionage Act. Now, the the work that the Inspector General Michael Horowitz is doing was supposed to be in concert with the guy from Utah, John Huber. Does he have a role in the prosecutions? Where does his name pop up? Huber? Yes, Huber. I have no idea. He could be a head fake by Jeff Sessions. That may have been Sessions' way of trying to just get that issue away from him. I see. Uh, his, Sessions was such an abomination as attorney general. Uh, I don't want to smear John Huber, but the truth is he's done nothing that anybody knows about. He's provided no indictments. There's been no report on his investigation. Okay. He may very well be indicting people or holding grand juries or whatever the hell it is that he's doing, but I have no idea what John Huber did. Right now, he's a nothing. As okay. Far as I'm well, concerned. speaking he has to prove his worth to me. Speaking of indictments, one of them that came down last week was against Julian Assange, uh, nominally for hacking, uh, but the reality here was that he was basically giving attaboys to. Uh, Bradley Manning encouraging him to do hacking, uh, but yeah. but that was one count. I didn't see any counts for colluding with Russia, which seemed to have been the most likely thing that you would pursue Julian Assange for. Why not? And what does that suggest to you? Uh, it suggests that there was no evidence of it, <laughs> because believe me, uh, if the Department of Justice and Mueller's people had had an opportunity to charge Julian Assange with colluding with the Russians as they did in the indictment, you know, they, you recall there's no collusion with the Russians in the Julian Assange indictment. Now, you'll remember that Mueller returned this goofy indictment against these Russians, all of these Russian military people, for hacking and doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Well, Assange, you know, wasn't charged with any of that. So what's going on here? Why wasn't this done? Why wasn't Assange charged with that? And the answer is because... There's no evidence. They uh, couldn't do it. Joe they, didn't have the, they didn't have the goods. And it's a, Andy McCarthy has a, a great article on this. I recommend it to people at National Review. Uh, but again, uh, this shows you just how bankrupt and corrupt the Mueller prosecution was. But the, the history of the Mueller prosecution is going to be very ugly for Bob Mueller. Believe me, it's going to, whatever's left of his reputation is going to be destroyed by the ultimate subsequent criminal prosecutions brought by Bill Barr. Joe, we have some questions uh, to go over with, with Roger Stone and Don McGahn, if you wouldn't mind staying with us. Sure. We're here with legal analyst and U.S. attorney to the District of Columbia, Joe DeGeneva, staying with us. Thank you so much for that, Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, Ro Roger Stone. Roger Stone uh, wants a full copy of the Mueller report for his criminal case. He also wants the charges dropped, saying he was selectively prosecuted. Is there any chance that he could possibly be successful in any of this? He may have a very good chance of getting the Mueller report because it may give him information relative to his innocence. And given the uh, history of Andrew Weissman, who is an absolute prosecutorial thug, who worked for Mueller and has a history of unethical and unprofessional behavior as a Justice Department employee, uh, I think Roger's lawyers may very well have an absolute right to access to the Mueller report. Indeed, their right, which is a constitutional right to a trial by jury, probably supersedes that of the House of Representatives, and they may be able to get all of the redacted grand jury information, which, of course, they may not be able to make public, but they can certainly use in a defense of their case, but he's going to have to prove relevance, but he's going to have an opportunity to do that, and he may win. As far as having the case dismissed for selective prosecution, um, those are rarely granted, but in this case, given the conduct of the special counsel's office, he may have a he may have a 50-50 shot at that. In other words, it would, the, the release of the Mueller report itself may assist him in that argument? It's not going to hurt him. It's only going to make them look better because there's no collusion that was found in the report. And by the way, Roger Stone is not charged with collusion. He's charged with lying to federal investigators and nothing else right. and lying to Congress. So the bottom line is uh, that he, he, they've got to be able to give him stuff that, can, that he can show. He was not lying when he, when he talked to Congress. How does that, that, there's just, 
So how would that work in practice? So in other words, like, you know, his lawyers want to see the unredacted Mueller report. Some of it may be protected for national security reasons, grand jury information, et cetera. They want to see the full thing. Is it possible for some sort of third party, neutral third party to say, here's the stuff that you may consider exculpatory and here's what you can see? Or is it going to just yes. be – how does yes. that work? Yeah. No, that, 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 that can be done. And, in fact, that's done all the time. It's been done historically where a special master, usually a U.S. magistrate, is given the, uh, the duty of finding out what he wants to see and then seeing if there's anything in the report that's relevant. And then they give it to him uh, in an unredacted or redacted form. But it, if, 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 it, if a judge determines that he's entitled to it, it has to be given to him in a usable form. Right. Remember, the government is putting him on trial. He's not volunteering for this. So he has certain rights which has to be met. And if there's exculpatory information, there's a constitutional right to that information, even though people like Mueller and Weissman try to hide that type of information from people all the time and regrettably have a history of doing so over a number of years without anybody in the Justice Department holding them accountable. ABC's John Carl said that the White House is concerned what Don McGahn might have said to the special counsel, saying there is significant concern on the president's team about what will be in this report. Mm -hmm. And what worries the most is what Don McGahn told the special counsel. Do they have a right to worry? Should they be worrying about what he said? Well, I would imagine that Don McGahn had very candid conversations with the president of the United States. I'm not personally aware of any of those, but it would make sense that he would have his White House counsel. And I'm sure the president said some things as, a, as an innocent man saying, you know, I really don't like this. I don't want to be investigated. I didn't do anything wrong. Just think of it this way. Suppose you were accused of a robbery that occurred on day X, and you discovered that there was never any robbery of that bank on day X. But they were going to charge you anyway. Wouldn't you be a little pissed about that? That's exactly where the president is, and he's furious. And I'm sure he said some pretty upset things to Don McGahn. And by the way, the issue here, by the way, isn't any longer the Mueller report. They can, they, there can be as much bad stuff in there. This is all politically bad stuff, by the way, if it's anything. It's not going to be legal bad stuff. Uh, let me just tell you something. The next two years are going to be about the criminal prosecution of senior DOJ, CIA, FBI people for violating the criminal laws of the United States. It's not going to be about Donald Trump. It's going to be about those corrupt people. And by the way, just let me just say this about this hearing the other day with Bill Barr. He came there to testify about the Department of Justice budget. It was that idiot from New Hampshire, Gene Sahin, the Democratic dumbbell, who said, was there spying that went on? He never used that word until she brought it up. It was a Democratic senator, Gene Sahin, who used the word spying, and now the Democrats are apoplectic. What a bunch of buffoons. In other words, it's a word used as a colloquial way to express that somebody was surveilled without their knowledge. It's not a term of the trade, but he was acknowledging it. It is a term of the trade. No, don't do that, Vince. People at the CIA call their work Spying. Right. They do it every friggin' day. You know what I mean? That it's crap about it's not a term of art. What it I mean, Joe, of art. what I mean, Joe, is that is is that the kind of thing that the average FBI agent might refer to it as? I'm not disagreeing. I think it's spying. I'm just saying that this is just a semantics debate that has no meaning. Uh, it is that and more. What it is, is it's an attempt to deflect from the obvious. It is worse than a deflection. It is it is fundamental dishonesty. And FBI agents do call it spying. Don't kid yourself. And to, so do people at the CIA. The only reason the Democrats don't like it is because it's extremely descriptive and accurate. Mm -hmm. That's what they don't like about it, because that's exactly what was done to Trump and his people. And you know who told him that it was going on? Admiral Mike Rogers, the head of NSA, went to him right after the election and before the inauguration and said, you and your campaign and your people were spied upon. You've there often electronic you've, surveillance of you. You've often referred to Mike Rogers as an important figure here. When are we going to hear from him again? Mike Rogers uh, has done what John Brennan and James Clapper should have done. He has shut up, and he's waiting to be subpoenaed for a grand jury. I'm sure he's been interviewed voluntarily by Mike Horowitz because it was Admiral Rogers, the great hero in this entire story of this scandal, it was Mike Rogers who went to the FISA court and said, Judge Collier, there has been massive illegal activity by the FBI over five years. You need to know about it, and you need to shut it down. And she did. And that's when John Carlin and Ash Carter, a name you rarely hear in this, 
tried to get Admiral Rogers fired, and so did James Clapper and John Brennan. And he was not fired because they couldn't possibly have done it. He will be testifying. As I said, I'm sure he's already been interviewed by Horowitz, but Admiral Rogers will be testifying in a series of grand juries against senior FBI and DOJ officials because he knows that they lied under oath to the FISA court and to other courts as well. Joe, always so interesting when we have you on. Thank you so much for sharing all the information with us. It's it's just really so important that this gets out there because it's a story that's not being told. Joe, thank you so much. Have a great week. You bet, guys. Joe DeGioia.